Welcome to Music Ed Tech Talk, a podcast about music, education, and technology. I'm your host, Robbie Burns. Hey, this week is a solo episode. I've got a cold. Hope you don't mind my voice being a little different. I'm just back from a week vacation, and I've had an exciting past month. I had a great conversation with Dr. Jim Frankel on the last episode of the show. I highly recommend you go check out that episode where we looked at the past year of music education technology and many of the developments and news that came up over the past year. And Jim is a really insightful person with a lot of industry knowledge, and I feel like he really brought a lot of awesome perspective to that episode. So I encourage you to check that out. Now I want to talk about the next three episodes, including this one. I am thrilled to be presenting at the New Jersey Music Educators Association Conference next month. It's going to be my first time there, and I'm going to be doing three sessions. Three of these sessions are topics that I have done before, both in a conference, but also on this podcast and on my blog. Now, two of the three, I feel like the podcast episodes have held up pretty well since I recorded them. So next month in February, kind of like leading up to this conference, I'm going to do a reissue of two past episodes. I'll perhaps add a little bit of some news updates up at the front of each episode, but then they're just going to be like a reissue. And my hope is that people who come to my sessions at this conference will be able to see these in the feed. Like if they go to my podcast, they'll be able to really quickly find a complimentary episode about these session topics But also, if you're a newer listener and you never heard these, then they'll be bumped to the top of your feed, too, and you'll be able to listen. And if you've heard them before, maybe you'll re-listen. Or if you have heard them before and you've taken in all the information that was helpful to you, then you can skip them. The three topics are digital organization tips for music teachers. That's today's episode. And then next month, teaching intonation with tonal energy. And then I'm going to be doing a reissue of my Soundtrap project your students will love, which is not the exact title of the session I'm doing next month, but I am doing one that is all about great project ideas using digital music software. So today's is going to be a little different. It is a topic I've covered, but because digital organization tips for music teachers is a topic I've presented on recently, but not podcasted on since 2016, I thought I would address some of the key areas that my productivity workflow has changed since then. And it hasn't changed in every way, but there's a couple of really noteworthy things that have changed in music ed tech that I think are worth covering here. So today I'm going to be revisiting the topic of digital organization tips for music teachers. And as I was doing this outline, it became apparent to me that one of the key differences between me now and me in 2016 is the way that I use note apps. So I'm actually even planning a future episode for later this winter, just about all the different note apps that are in my workflow. I did want to cover one piece of news that has come out, and that is that Muse Group has acquired Hal Leonard. And I would like to cover this on the show at a later time. But in the meantime, I encourage you to check out the show notes. I will link a really, really excellent overview of that whole situation from the Scoring Notes blog. They cover it in in tremendous detail. Muse Group is, of course, the company behind Muse Score, StaffPad, Muse Class, and several other free-to-use apps for musicians. And then, of course, you know who Hal Leonard is. There's a lot of interesting implications. Hal Leonard has some digital tools like NoteFlight, uh, and they have a huge content library. And, you know, Muse Group is continuing to develop tools that are really accessible to teachers and students. So I think long-term, I'm interested to see in what ways they uh, utilize this tremendous business that Hal Leonard has become to us as teachers and should be interesting. So check out the scoring notes post and hoping to cover that more in the future. Okay, here it is. Digital organization tips for music teachers revisited. Now, when I last talked about this topic on the show, I did an entire second season dedicated to it where every episode is about a different chapter of the book. And I have a different guest on every one of those episodes to talk in depth about that topic. So if you go back to season two of this show, back before it was even called Music Ed Tech Talk, you can hear a lot of information about these topics there. But I wanted to start by talking about what has most changed since I recorded that sequence of episodes and wrote my book. And in some ways, not a lot has really changed. I tried to focus the book on workflows, not so much apps or tools. So it's workflow-based, not prescriptive. Some ideas and apps are a little out of date, but the principles still remain the same. 
with a few exceptions, of course. One of these is that in education, there is a proliferation of web apps. This means that while a lot of us are using computers that do run native apps, things like mail applications and web browsers and notes apps, we're also using lots of things that run in the tab of a web browser, creative tools like NoteFlight and Soundtrap, learning management software, and all of the many external tools that come along with them, and things like Google Docs. If you're using a lot of native applications and a lot of web applications, there are not a whole lot of meaningful ways that you can organize data that's in, say, like the Apple Notes app with, say, like your Google Drive. Like these are sort of two separate areas. One is existing on the web inside of a tab of your web browser, and then another is like storing that data locally. Now, both are cloud syncing options because everything these days is syncing to the cloud. But like kind of wrangling and making meaning out of those two different places where data might live is a challenge. Also, consider your students are living pretty much only inside of web apps. This is like, to them, web apps are native apps. Like, this is what is most comfortable and familiar to them because they grew up, many of them, using things like Google Docs. And all of their learning is happening for many of them inside of learning management software. That's, if it is using another tool, it's probably linking externally to that tool, but it is a web tool. So students are really aware of this concept of like all of your data on the web just sort of like freely floating out there and being very quick to access through search. Whereas people who grew up using computers, maybe from a different era, are much more comfortable with this idea of there being a file system on their computer. And this distinction was just starting to become a thing that I was making in my book. I'm pretty clear that I really think that there's certain ways to organize that are better on the web, certain ways to organize that are better inside of the file system of your computer. And then there's ways to organize where you're organizing something inside of the app that you created it in. And for our students, they're using so much the web option that I think it's important to recognize that, you know, when you're teaching and you have to interact with the file system of the students' computers, whether they be, you know, whatever platform they are, like if it's a Mac or a Windows or a Chromebook, which is what I assume most students are using, my students are using Chromebooks, you're going to have to really teach that concept because I know that as soon as I have to interact with the file system on my students' Chromebooks, they need a lot of support in figuring out how that works. Because they're not always thinking on the web about like there being sort of a metaphor of like a place on the computer that a thing goes, that a file goes. Another thing that's changed a lot since my book came out is the concept of the second brain and personal knowledge management. Apps like Notion, Craft, and Obsidian have taken over in the note-taking space and can be really, really useful tools for creating a network of thought. A lot of the apps that manage this kind of data, some of them do it better natively, some of it do it better on the web. Not really any of them interface with what students see unless you're using a tool that can publish stuff to the web. And I think this can get pretty interesting because like one app I've used a lot over the past two years is called Craft, and it has some very document and note-taking kinds of tools and features, but you can actually publish your notes to the web and provide a URL to students. So you can actually create little bits of data that are organized in your own personal network of notes, but then that are actually accessible to other people online, which can be really useful. And then lastly, and then maybe this one is just personal for me, my school district has gone further and further down the Google Drive, Google ecosystem rabbit hole, and I'm just like completely overflowing with tabs in my web browser at all times, like so many Google Docs between Sheets, slides and, and docs, uh, and then an occasional Google form, there's, there needs to be a way to wrangle that. And I have some ideas. This sort of relates a little bit to the first thing I said about like web apps becoming more popular and more default in education. Managing all of that data and finding it is tricky, especially if you also are trying to like make meaningful connections between that data and some of the data that lives inside of your other apps, like your email app, your notes app, the files in your file system. So we're going to get into all that a little bit. But first, let's talk about this very important idea of what types of data there are on a computer and where they go. So there's a lot of different ways you can organize stuff on the web. But if you're dealing specifically just with files on your computer's hard drive, you know that you can do folders, nested folders even, folders within folders. But what a lot of operating systems do these days is also offer tags. So I'm using macOS. And I know that for me, I use the tagging feature inside of the Finder, which allows me to give things categories and tags in addition to the possible folders that they might be inside of. So for example, I have a folder for all of my Ellicott Mills Middle School stuff, but a file can only live inside of one folder. 
whereas it can have numerous tags associated with it. So if you want to kind of like have your files exist a little bit more like your stuff on the web, you might consider having a lighter folder structure. I know a lot of people who like to go real serious on folders, like it's very methodical and organized. But to me in 2024, I get a lot more mileage out of being more sparse in my folder organization. Like I think it's okay to just have a bunch of files sort of scattered around inside of a folder that has a loose project name or maybe just like the title of the folder it describes an area of your life. And then tags can be really meaningful. For example, uh, a file that includes a roster for my concert band class might have the tag roster and concert band and wind ensemble and symphonic winds. It might have lots of different tags associated with it. Whereas a file that is existing inside of another folder on my computer's hard drive might, it might contain a, a keynote presentation that I use in front of all of my band classes in the morning. Maybe I would also tag that file, concert band, wind ensemble. Maybe I would also tag it presentation or important because I, I use it every day. It's my most opened keynote presentation. You can get a little bit uh, more flexible with tags. And then of course you do have app organization. Some apps still lend themselves towards organizing their data inside of the app. For example, notes. I use Apple notes quite a bit these days and I don't actually go into the finder to find those individual notes. I access all of them inside of the app notes. Now, when it comes to my web apps, things like Google drive, Soundtrap, NoteFlight, canvas, this is where things get a little, a little bit trickier. One option for you is to use the tab group feature inside of your browser. And I know Chrome and Safari are the two web browsers that I've used this feature the most in. And this is this idea that I can say, okay, like I've got this gradebook tab, this gradebook tab, this Google Doc, this Google Sheet, and they're all sort of loosely related to this class or to my school job. You can create a tab group that permanently has those tabs open inside of it. And it's sort of like you're organizing them inside of a little folder. They're still websites, but you're just kind of wrangling them together in a way where you can sort of, you know, go specifically to all those tabs and have them permanently open. It functions in your web browser, depending on which one you use. And it's a little bit of a flimsier feeling than having files that are open on your computer because sometimes the websites need to reload. I actually prefer Google Chrome's implementation of this better than Safari's because it organizes them along the top rather than along the side and you can color code them. Tab groups in Apple's Safari are good. I like them, but they have some weird quirks. For example, uh, sometimes when I click on a link inside of an email, it does not open inside of the desired tab group and there's not a whole lot of control I have over that. Now, if you have a bunch of files on your computer and a bunch of tabs in a web browser, like URLs, Google Docs, for example, and you need a place to say, okay, like these are a bunch of different files that are related to the same idea, the same project. There's a really great app I like for the Mac called Hook. And what Hook does is it tries to basically take a link to whatever piece of data you're looking at and then make a URL and copy it to your clipboard that you can paste somewhere else and then like click into that. So for example, I might be looking at an email or a note in Apple Notes or a Pages document or a Microsoft Office document or a file in the file system or a website. And invoking a keyboard shortcut will allow me to clip a link to my, key to my clipboard and then paste that into another place. So what I've gotten into the habit of doing is if I have a project where my files are spanning lots of different places across lots of different apps on the web and on my computer, I will create a note that acts as sort of a dashboard. And then I will create links inside of that note out to all the important things so that they're all sort of categorized in the same place and one click away. Uh, now tab groups are really great, but I did a huge cleanup of my bookmarks inside of my web browsers earlier this year. And I've actually been kind of getting back into this idea of bookmarking, like having folders of bookmarks alongside the top area of my web browser. This has been really helpful for me because I was noticing that, yes, there are some school Google Docs that I need to have open permanently quite a lot, but the amount of tabs that I had open was just getting ridiculous. And the way that I tend to use a web browser, at least on my Mac, is open tabs are sort of like decisions that I have not made yet. So like things I want to look at or things that require action or things that I'm intending to get to later in the day. And that gets really confusing when you have a bunch of like permanently open stuff, even if they're organized in separate groups. So what I've started to do is just get a little bit more detailed about having bookmarks 
And then my habit is to close the tab when I'm actually done using the site. And I'm getting a little bit more aggressive about that. So like, even if I think I might open that same file later in the week or even later in the day, I just close the tab. And then my default positioning on the Mac is much more similar to how I use my mobile devices where a tab or a website is just sort of like out of sight, out of mind. If I'm not looking at it or if it's not open, it's not really that important to me. And you can always move the action somewhere else. For example, we're going to talk when we get to tasks, you can, you know, in a lot of great task apps, you can clip something like a website into the notes field of a task if it's something that requires action at a later time. So I'm, I'm keeping a pretty clean web browser these days. And I like to get all those web-based files kind of like strung up together in a meaningful way. All right, we'll come back to tasks and notes in a second, but I want to talk a little bit about email. My email workflow is pretty similar to the way it was in 2016. I'm always trying new mail services and new mail apps. I kind of keep coming back to the Apple Mail app. I do like to distinguish between an app and a service. Whatever email service your school district uses can be plugged into any email client. For example, I use my Microsoft 365 school work account and my personal Gmail account both inside of the Apple Mail app. And one thing that's really changed about my workflow is in my book, I was really into this idea of like having everything all in the same place, but I'm finding that I'm getting more work done and being more productive lately if I'm not always just looking at everything. I'm getting much more contextual and I'm doing this through software and through hardware. I'm doing this through software with the use of an awesome Apple feature called Focus Modes. And this has been covered on this show numerous times elsewhere, so I won't get too into it. But it's the idea that in the settings, you can create a custom focus mode, which based on where you are, like location or time, it will allow only certain types of people and certain types of apps to notify you. And additionally, it will actually filter content inside of those apps. For example, I have a focus mode for work that triggers when I get inside of the geofence, which is my school. So like when I get to school in the morning, my phone, my iPad, my Mac all snap into work focus mode. And then even though I have my personal and my work email accounts set up in Apple Mail, Apple Mail can be set up to filter only the ones that are relevant to that focus mode. So I only see work email in the Apple Mail app when I'm at work. The reverse happens when I get home. I have a personal focus mode that operates pretty much whenever I'm not at work. I have a couple of other ones too. And then I can even change the notifications. So I can have only my close work colleagues or my wife's text messages will go through to my phone when I'm in a work focus mode. A lot of great apps have this feature. My calendar app, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but my calendar app of choice, Fantastical, can filter which calendars show up inside of their app based on your focus mode. You can even, if you're using Safari, choose which tab groups show up when you're in a particular focus mode. So if you do wanna use tab groups and you wanna use Safari, you could have Safari just show you your work tabs when you get to your desk. Now this is one really great way to create context because for me, there's so limited time at work. I really like to just be focused on work when I'm at work and not just kind of having my brain be all scattered around. But there are also some physical things that you can consider. And I'm actually kind of going backwards in time in this regard. It's going to sound, those of you who've listened to this show for a while, this is going to sound totally not like me. But I'm getting a little bit more contextual about like which device I'm sitting in front of. Like there's certain stuff that I only do on my Mac and certain stuff that I only do on my iPad. I kind of do everything on my phone because I, it's always with me. I need it to be most like my digital brain. But like on my Mac, that's kind of like the only place I really do a lot of serious work email because I always have my Mac when I'm at work. For the past six months, this will sound crazy, but like I don't really use my Mac that much when I'm at home. I kind of just go to my iPad and my iPhone for the rest of the day. Another area where I'm considering this is my iPad. My iPad is sometimes behaving like a secondary laptop when the Mac needs to be doing something else in the classroom, but it's also just sort of functioning as a digital piece of paper. I'm using a lot of apps that take advantage of the Apple Pencil and that take advantage of just the singular raw iPad sitting on a music stand without a whole lot of extra accessories like keyboards and, and other things like that. So it's working really great for me as something to read sheet music off of, take notes on, and do other kinds of contextual things on, but then I'm not really like doing a whole lot of those tasks on my other devices. Because I'm functioning in this way and making a conscious effort to be more focused on certain areas of my life at certain times of day, what this means is I've actually taken my work email off my phone. Yes, that's right, off my phone. Like it is just simply not logged in in the system preferences of my iPhone. And this, I believe, is making me so much more productive. 
Now, of course, I could use a, fil a focus filter, and that would work too, just as, easily on, just as easily on my phone as I do on my Mac and my iPad. In fact, focus filters and focus modes sync across devices. So when one device goes into a focus mode, all of the others do too. Now, I still do believe in inbox zero, and that means getting my email all out of my email inbox and into other apps. So there's a couple things that an email might need from me when I see it. And I, and I believe that most email can be acted on immediately. Some emails need to be turned into tasks because they need my time and attention in a future date. A great task app is gonna have a feature where you can forward an email into your inbox of your task app and then give that task future due date. Typically in the notes field, it will include the whole message or a link to that message. Apps that I really like that have this feature are Todoist, Things, and OmniFocus. This will get rid of like most of your email because email that actually requires your attention probably doesn't require it right in that moment. If it did, somebody sh would, they wouldn't be emailing it to you if it required because email is an asynchronous communication tool. So what I usually do is forward anything that requires future action into my task app and now it's out of sight, out of mind. Sometimes I wanna be able to reference an email more long-term and I always archive rather than delete my email, but sometimes I will put my email inside of a note app. Some note apps like Evernote allow you to do that similar email forwarding feature, but since I lately am using other kinds of note tools, I'll usually just use the Hook app I mentioned earlier to get a little link to my clipboard, and then I'll paste the email link inside of another note. Now, some emails require a response. These are the ones that take the longest for me to get to. Some, of course, can be deleted or archived immediately, and then others, maybe you wanna, it's a communication thing, but it requires you to communicate at a later time. And so a good email app in 2024 will allow you to snooze email messages to future days, which basically just means they leave your inbox and then re-enter it on a future time. I don't totally love Apple Mail's feature for this. I don't like the way it behaves. So I use something called SaneBox, which is a paid subscription service, which adds this feature amongst other cool features to any email service and any app. So it doesn't matter like what your app is or even like what your email service is under the hood. It will allow you to do some advanced email filtering, snooze email messages, and a whole bunch of other cool things. Now between these things, communicating, communicating in the future, turning it to a task, referencing it as a note, or delete archiving it, that pretty much allows me to tear through my email inbox pretty quickly. And because I can do that, I usually don't even leave my email open anymore. I usually have it closed with the exception of a couple times per day. And when I open it those couple times, I really try to like get through all of it and really address all of it that I can. I'd also like to take a second and acknowledge that there are other ways to communicate with your school team other than email. Slack and Microsoft Teams offer much more st streamlined, much better options for communication where you can take different threads of communication or different topics and organize them along the sidebar. Taking that formality and that weight out of the equation that email so often introduces can really make you go faster on your team. My team tried Microsoft Teams earlier this year and found that it was basically just a worse implementation of Slack. So if you have a team of three or four or more and you wanna introduce some better communication into your life, I would recommend trying out Slack. I have an episode about communication in music teams as well, which I will link in the show notes to this episode. Text messaging is also a thing. My music team uses a lot of iMessage to communicate, and that just makes things really fast and sharp and efficient. Sometimes having an email thread that can be searched inside of an email app that involves other parties can be a really useful thing. So we kind of do have to come back and be a little bit formal every now and then if it's gonna make future correspondences easier to search and reference. But for a lot of our internal stuff, we're just using iMessage and Slack. Since we're getting a lot of our email out of email and into tasks, let's talk a little bit about those. I still subscribe loosely to the Getting Things Done methodology by David Allen. I do use a couple of task apps, and I'm actually happy to say that I'm using less now than I ever was before. I use the Apple Reminders app for pretty much anything that I need to be reminded of at a specific time. So like if it's take out the trash or have this conversation with this staff member at this time, because I know I'll be like in a meeting with them, I'll have a lot of that stuff show up in the Apple Reminders app because it pings me at a specific time and then the notification just kind of hangs on my home screen until I address it, which is really helpful. Now there is an app called Do, which takes this idea of the notification hanging and takes it a step further by like actually sending you repeat notifications until you do the task. 
And I really like that app. I'm using it a little less because it was like a little bit much to have so many to-do apps in my life. And Reminders does a much better job these days of being persistent. But Do is a really cool option if you're just the kind of person who like you need your phone to just keep saying like, hey, 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 do this thing at this time. Now for tasks that are not so sensitive to the exact minute they need to be done, I like to organize them into more of a project manager. And for these, I love things like Todoist, OmniFocus, and Things. And there are a lot of other competing apps, but I'm just going to leave you with those three. If you're in the Apple ecosystem, OmniFocus and Things are really worth checking out. Things is a little bit easier to get into, but OmniFocus is definitely a power tool that is virtually limitless in which you can do with it. Now, if you're interacting with people who are not in the Apple ecosystem, or if you yourself are not in the Apple ecosystem, Todoist is really great. It has web apps, but also apps for every platform. And one of the things I like about Todoist is they kind of like take a lot of the features from a lot of the other to-do apps and have try to like integrate as many of them as they can into the app. So it has like a really good list of stuff. Like you can put things in projects, you can tag things, you can have notifications. Every task can have subtasks, a notes field, a URL that it links out to. You can have collaborative lists. This has been really awesome for me. Like I had a student teacher earlier this year and we could like both see inside of the same list and be checking off the same tasks. You could even like assign someone a specific task to offer ultimate clarity, like who is expecting to do what. So Todoist is typically the task app I recommend people start with. The reason I don't love it for me personally is because OmniFocus and Things have something called a start date, which is basically this idea of it will show up in your list the day that you want to be thinking about it and working on it. But then the day that it's actually due, like where things in your life will start to fall apart if you don't do it, that's like a separate date, a later date. And so this idea that I can have lots of things on my radar that I'm focused on, but then an extra date that is actually like when the task turns red and starts to like alarm me, those two different things, that's really important to me. Other apps like Todoist and Apple Reminders don't distinguish this. If you give a task a due date, it's not really a due date as much as it is a due time. And to me, something that I'm sort of persistently working on and thinking about and focusing on is a different kind of task than something that I don't need to think about until the minute it's due and then I really need to think about it and then it's over with. Now notes is where things get complicated. This is why I'm planning a whole episode later in this year about all of my many note apps. I've kind of stopped using Evernote altogether and am using a little bit of a hybrid of Apple Notes, Craft, Obsidian, and GoodNotes. Now it's a little easier to describe where these apps fit some more than others. For example, GoodNotes is pretty much just what I do my seating charts in. It's the best app for getting handwritten notes to be easy to do on an iPad. I do use it on the Mac for reference, but most of my actual note taking is happening on an iPad screen. Since what it's really good at is creating an environment where you can just touch the Apple Pencil to the screen and immediately begin writing. Like there's no annotation mode. You just touch the, the pen to the screen and then you're immediately drawing on something. And this is great for if you prefer to take handwritten notes. But for me, what I do is I make note templates that are based on PDFs. And those PDFs are often seating charts for my band rehearsal. And then I write on top of the students' names informal data that I observe inside of my classes, which helps me to generate grades, address concerns, instrument needs, follow up on things that happen. It's just a really seamless and easy way to write stuff down on my iPad screen without really stopping the flow of rehearsal. And then of course, I can go back and look at it later. And because I'm pretty much only doing handwritten stuff in GoodNotes, that means that a lot of my other stuff is happening in Craft, Obsidian, and in Apple Notes. Now, Obsidian and Craft are both arguably personal knowledge management tools, which means that they have this feature where one note can backlink to another note, meaning like you can reference a note inside of a note, and then clicking it will like take you to the note that you're referencing. And this is a really powerful tool, especially if you want to build a wiki style interface, which is what my music team has done using craft. We have built a band wiki, which is basically just a network of different craft notes, all of which that contain information. And clicking on one link within one craft note will take you to another craft note. And these information areas uh, include everything from our syllabus to our band handbook to information about where to find instruments and what sheet music to practice and where, you know, it, it links to concert recordings 
of our performances. It just is like a huge network of all information we want our parents and students to have all networked together. And what's cool is in Craft, you can edit all of this stuff kind of just as easily as a note app. You don't need an internet connection. You don't need to like wait for a loading time. You don't need to type a character and then wait for your browser to connect to the internet for that character to type. You just interact with it fluidly like you're taking notes. And then when you're done, you can share a link to that note with anyone. And that's kind of how we've developed our own band wiki. Obsidian is really great too. Uh, it functions somewhat similarly, but it's not as good as at the note sharing thing. So I use it more for my own personal knowledge. One feature that both of these apps have that I really like is a daily note, where every day on a calendar, you can like click a day on a calendar and then be taken to a note where you take notes on just that day. This has been really helpful for me because I, I really struggle to keep together like what I wanna do in each rehearsal and more specifically, the things I need to tell my students logistically every day or the things that happen in rehearsal that I need to go back and act on later. So I have a daily note template inside of Obsidian that basically has a heading for each of my classes I teach and I will start the day, I will pre-populate stuff I need to tell my students and address and then if anything comes up in class, I'll add it to the bottom of each heading. And this is really good like when I'm in my email, if I, you know, a parent, for example, the other day said, hey, my our child's oboe is like missing a screw, can you address this? And I knew that I wasn't gonna see that student for another day or two. So I went to the day in the daily note section that I knew I was gonna see that student and that I wanted to address that with them. And then I added a bullet point to that class's notes area, just reminding me, hey, don't forget to talk to the student about the oboe thing. And in that way, I sort of have like a calendar pre-populated with all the relevant stuff I need to tell my students and do in class. And of course you can like put your daily agenda or some of your lesson objectives or goals inside of this daily note. And the daily note can have links out to other notes. So if you wanna like have assignment descriptions, like I mean, Obsidian is, is a very powerful tool. I do a lot of stuff in it. I sometimes will like the text that I'm gonna put inside of my lesson assignments, I will like draft it inside of Obsidian. And then I will have sort of like a network of different Canvas assignment descriptions that are all like in my Obsidian database, but that link, they don't like meaningfully link, but they're like are titled the same way as assignments that I do regularly inside of Canvas. So I can always sort of like go into Obsidian and find out like what Canvas message did I send on this date to these people? Or like what, you know, where is the text that I use to describe this assignment on this date? And that way I have sort of an offline non-networked version of that content inside of my notes. And it's really cool because in my daily note, I can do something like under my general music heading, I can say, hey, on this day, I assigned this assignment. And then where I'm describing the assignment I assigned, that can link to its own note in Obsidian that gives me the assignment name, the canvas description, any, I can like also just take informal notes on kids, like who has done this work, who is struggling with, with which concepts. You can even create a note in Obsidian for every student you teach. And then those student notes can backlink to assignment names or to daily notes because all of these are like sort of interlinking. So I could have a note for a student named, for example, DJ, and it can in his note say like on this date, he did this assignment and struggled with fingering. And where it says the date and the assignment, those would be links to that daily note and to that assignment description inside of my Obsidian database. It's just a really powerful tool. Now for pretty much everything else, I'm using Apple Notes. And this is just sort of like, quick notes throughout the day, but it's also shared notes. So I can have a shared notebook with my music team where all of us can be typing notes and editing the same notes as each other in Apple Notes. I really hate using Google Docs as a note-taking tool because of how cumbersome it is to manage all of the varying documents. And of course, like a note can be a lengthier thing with mixed media, but can also just be like a couple of sentences. And so I don't need a heavy tool like Google Docs for that. And my music team fortunately agrees. So we have this shared Apple Notes folder with a bunch of shared notes that we can all type into. And Apple Notes just keeps getting better and better every year. It's got some of the stuff now that Google Docs and that Obsidian and Craft and these other PKM tools have added over the years. So you can now backlink notes inside of your Apple Notes. Here's a, a personal example. I recently went on a vacation to Disney World and I have a shared Disney note with my mother and my wife who went on that trip. Well, I wanted to make another note with my packing list and I titled that note, Disney Packing List, only the word Disney in the title backlinked to the Disney note that I was sharing with my family. So that's the kind of way I'm thinking about shared notes. You can also now do callouts and see version history 
along the side in Apple Notes. So if you're sharing a note with other people, they can mention you with an at symbol and then you'll get notified. Or you can see like who made which edits and when. It's pretty, a pretty powerful system. I'll be simple about music. My workflow has not changed a whole lot. I use Fourscore for all of my sheet music needs. Fourscore is now on the Mac, which is awesome because I can do a lot of my finer data management on the Mac where I can much more precisely click and drag and select multiple things at once. It's great for like managing playlists. Like if, you know, I recently co-directed our district's middle school GT honor band. So I can create a playlist with all the scores that were performing on that concert. And then when I jump over to my iPad, that is like in sync. So I can just really quickly tap on playlists, honor band, and then choose the piece that I'm about to conduct. It just makes it really seamless. Four score continues to be one of the most awesome experiences across all Apple platforms. And I'm really excited to see where it goes from here because it's always adding really nice little features. Here's a nice new little feature of Fourscore even just that came out in the past year. You can now create a link straight to a piece of information in Fourscore and then paste that elsewhere. So if you're say in Obsidian, writing your daily agenda of which pieces you wanna do in your rehearsal, the title of each piece could be a link that when you click that link, it takes you straight to that score instead of four score. So if you're like me and you have your notes for the, for the day on one part of your iPad screen and your score is on the other, you can now just like tap each piece as it comes up in your rehearsal and then get taken straight into it. Now for making things digital that are not digital already, there's two apps worth checking out. One is called Scanner Pro. I'm not gonna say too much about it other than that it is my favorite thing for scanning a document and then turning it into a nice looking PDF and then putting it somewhere. If you're looking to make music into an XML file, like you wanna take a piece of sheet music and get that into your system as like a playable thing or a thing that you could edit in notation software, the Sheet Music Scanner remains one of my tools I use regularly, as does PlayScore 2, both of which will allow you to take a scan of a piece of sheet music and then will make it playable inside of their app, but also something that you can send to either Sibelius or Dorico or Finale for future editing. Now for editing audio, I still use Apple Music as my primary music streaming service. I love that they have an Apple Music Classical app, which allows advanced metadata filtering for finding artists. Like you could say, find me this piece, and then it'll show you like every recording of that piece in the Apple Music database. I did a whole episode on Apple Music Classical. I'll link that in the show notes. I also use YouTube Music. It's part of my YouTube Premium subscription and it comes with a YouTube music subscription, so I sometimes use that in the classroom as well. To be honest though, when I'm playing a file, I'm finding it easier and easier than rather than just using my Apple Music app, uh, I'm just searching stuff on YouTube. It's like actually faster, which is in part just because there's so much music out there that sometimes just like searching it and going straight to it is easier than messing with your database. But also the Apple Music app is kind of slow and annoying. So that's sort of why I'm spending so much time on YouTube. Now, I used to take all my concert recordings and put those inside of Apple Music. But I'm finding that more and more these days, streaming services and their associated apps are really only designed to be useful for things that are like published through, you know, professional channels, like things that are recorded in a recording studio, given metadata, maybe associated with a record label, and then are published you know, on Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, all these services. So like my own personal recordings, I tend to now organize in the Finder or I, if they're things that I want to be public and can be public, I put them up on my YouTube page, which even though YouTube is really a video service, it, to be honest, it's so ubiquitous that it kind of just makes sense that if I want something that you could listen to to be shareable on the web, YouTube is a not a terrible place to put it. This brings us to automation. That's right, making a lot of this stuff happen automatically can save you so much time. My main automation tools these days are Drafts, Hazel, Text Expander, and Keyboard Maestro. But more and more, I'm using shortcuts for a lot of the things I used to be using some of these other tools for. So I'll just overview these all really quick. Hazel is a file management tool. It runs on the Mac. And you can set up rules that are really similar to email rules, but that act on files rather than email. So you could say, if this file is in this folder and ends in the extension PDF, move it to this other folder. Or you could say, if a file has been sitting on my desktop unopened for 18 months, put it in the trash. And this can be really helpful for doing some of that 
difficult file management that so often makes our desktops just end up full of clutter. Drafts is a kind of like a Swiss army knife tool for text. It, it's kind of like follows the same inbox methodology of task and note apps where you can like hit a keyboard shortcut to really quickly get some text inside of drafts. But what drafts does is it doesn't just make it easy to get stuff into it. It has these advanced actions that you can perform on each of your draft notes that can like do something with it or send it somewhere. So like when I open drafts, if I have a bunch of different notes that are sort of hanging in there, I have a sidebar, which I can tap on different options to send it to other apps. For example, I could, maybe I started typing a journal post and I want to send that to my day one journal app, or I want to send something to Apple notes or to obsidian, or it actually really is kind of more of a task. So I want to save it to things or OmniFocus, or maybe it's actually kind of like a text message. Well, there's an action for that too, an action to take that text and put it inside of a, an unaddressed text message where you just enter who you want to send it to, and then it'll send straight from within drafts. So this is a great tool if you need a clutter-free and clean place to just get your thoughts really quickly, and then you want to go through and send them to the correct place later. Text Expander is an app that allows you to create snippets that will expand into greater bodies of text. For example, um, I type intermediate snare drum method with correct capitaliza capitalization quite a lot when I'm telling my students which method book I want them to get for the snare drum. So I can just type the acronym ISDS and Text Expander will expand that to the correct title. And you can do this for long lengthy titles of things, for class names. I do it for instruments. So whenever I type in BD, it types the word bass drum for me. You can type in D date, which will expand the current date. So I don't ever like think about the date or the time. I just type D date for the date or T time for the time. And then you can have dynamic snippets as well. So for example, if you're going to type the same email to several people, you can open the body of an email and say, like, let's say I'm sending an email to tell a parent that they missed their weekly sectional. I can type sectional email inside of the body of the email, and then it'll actually pull up a prompt first, which lets me type in the name of the child. And then when I hit enter, it'll pre-fill that whole email, but with the child's name in the appropriate spots. I also really like Keyboard Maestro, which allows me to create kind of like advanced strings of actions that happen. And what's cool about Keyboard Maestro is that it can do things like type keystrokes for you, kind of like Text Expander, but it can also do really crazy, ridiculous stuff like find this image on screen and click it. So like if you have a repeat task you're doing in your learning management software, often you can like program Keyboard Maestro to like do it for you by saying like, on this screen, click this button. On this screen, click this button. On this, you can create these advanced strings of repeat steps that happen automatically. Now, of course, the Shortcuts app works really similarly to that, at least in the sense that you take different actions from a database of, I don't know, hundreds, thousands of actions, and then you drag and drop them in the order that you want them to happen. But Shortcuts is getting more and more powerful and easier and easier to use. For example, if you've never opened that Shortcuts app on your Apple device, it's just buried in a folder, go to it and then create a new shortcut. You will see that now third-party apps can offer certain actions of their apps inside of shortcuts without you even needing to create a custom shortcut. In fact, they're even searchable from the spotlight. So if you swipe down on your phone and you type in the words new note, at least for me what happens is the shortcut that Apple has to like create a new note inside of the notes app appears as an option for me. And the same is true of any other app. Like Drafts has great implementation for these shortcuts where if I type new note, like one of the options that appears in my spotlight is to create a new note inside of drafts. And I didn't even have to create that shortcut manually inside of the shortcuts app. It's just there for me, made by the third-party developer. One of my other automation tools lately has been Raycast. Raycast is kind of like a third-party app that replaces the spotlight feature, but only on the Mac. And what I like about Raycast is that it has an extension library that other third-party users can create and then submit. So what happens is like I can go inside of Raycast and I can use it for basic stuff that Spotlight does, like typing in certain file names or doing Google searches. And I can do this all without taking my hands off the keyboard. But with extensions, I can also type craft and then the space and then start typing text and then it'll search inside of my craft database for whatever text I type. Or I can create a new note inside of Obsidian all without even launching the Obsidian app. I can just do it straight from within Raycast. So like Raycast, I hit command spacebar to initiate, and then I type Obsidian space, and then I start typing a note, and then I hit enter, and then it just immediately saves that text to Obsidian. It integrates with my to-do app of choice, 
with web browsers, with my bookmarks inside of Chrome, you name it. People are constantly making new and awesome plugins that will integrate your services and apps inside of this very, very easy to launch tool. One of my favorite ones, it's a little buggy and it's like made by, I think, just one person. So I don't know how much time they're dedicating towards maintaining it, but it is a pretty cool thing. It actually allows me to integrate my canvas inside of Raycast. So I can invoke it, command spacebar, type in the word canvas, and then I can, without actually needing to fiddle with the Canvas web interface, I can actually see like all of my classes and like page through their assignments and like the due dates of those assignments, my modules, content inside of my modules. I can do that all from this like Mac app that runs natively on my computer's hard drive and is like super easy to invoke. Well, I did all that in under an hour and this is a topic that I wrote a book about. So hopefully uh, this gave you some ideas of some apps to go try and check out. Most of the stuff I talked about today has entire episodes dedicated to it previously in the show. So scroll through the feed. I'll also include some reference episode links inside of the show notes for today's episode. If you are going to be at the New Jersey Music Educators Association Conference in February, uh, I hope that you come say hi, that you check out some of my sessions. This will be one of them, and it would be really good to connect with you. And of course, if you have any questions about today's episode, or there are things you would like me to cover in more detail, I would love to hear from you. Talk to you next time. I'm Robbie Burns. Thanks for listening to Music Ed Tech Talk. You can find the show's page, show notes for this episode, and my blog at musicedtechtalk.com. You can subscribe to blog posts through an RSS app of your choice, and you can subscribe to the podcast in a podcast app of your choice. You can now get blog posts delivered right into your email inbox once a week. Please rate and review this show in the podcast app. It absolutely helps. Word of mouth is helpful too, so please spread the word about it. You can learn more about my music and teaching career at RobbieBurns.com. I'm all over the internet at Robbie Burns or underscore Robbie Burns on most social media sites. On Mastodon, I'm Robbie at social.musicedtechtalk.com. Consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash musicedtechtalk. All tiers get perks, but even the base tier gets you access to the Music Ed Tech Talk Discord community, where you can chat with other supporters and guests of the show about music, apps, pedagogy, lesson ideas, tech support, and more. It's a fun place to be, and I hope to connect with you there. Thanks to this episode's sponsor, Scale Exercise Play Along Tracks. Be sure to check it out. See you next time.